نحمده و نصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد I welcome all the viewers of Peace TV for this unique series of interviews wherein we invite shuyukh scholars students of knowledge and dais from all across the globe to share the wonderful knowledge of Islam with us and the viewers of Peace TV Today we have with us Sheikh Suleiman Salim from United States of America Sheikh Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a pleasure to have you in our studios today. And inshallah, before we begin with, I would want you to introduce yourself to the audience. What have your studies been in Islam? What do you do at present? Jazakallah khair for having me. I'm really a nobody in regards to spreading the message of Islam. I'm just one individual of many who are trying to challenge the many misconceptions about Islam in the West. So I grew up for most of my life in the United States. And Alhamdulillah, I have a practicing family and practicing parents. And since a young age, my father has really tried to instill in us the subject and the topic of being firm as believers and trying to clarify the message of Islam to others. And so Alhamdulillah, I'm trying to do what I can. I'm not really anybody who is doing anything major. However, alhamdulillah, most of my life, anytime something has come up in regards to the topic of Islam and misconceptions, both to Muslims and to non-Muslims, so da'wah is important to both believers and disbelievers. Uh, so alhamdulillah, I've had many experiences. I've been an imam at a masjid for a while, and I've been given da'wah to a lot of non-Muslims, alhamdulillah. I'm trying currently to continue down that path because it's needed in many countries, it's needed in many societies, and rather it's now needed all over the world. So alhamdulillah, we have the blessing of media in our day and age. We have the blessing of social media. We have the internet and the technology. So we have the capacity and the capability and the potential to reach many, many people. And so alhamdulillah, I actually studied media as my undergraduate studies in order to get further into this field, to spread the da'wah and the message of Islam to as many people as possible. And the reason I feel so strongly about it is not only because it is my faith and I feel that it is the truth, but rather also I see people around me some friends and acquaintances and many people who I grew up with. So these people are surrounded by the misconceptions in society. They're surrounded by the temptations of this world. They're surrounded by the corrupt ideologies that are very strong and powerful and widespread in our day and age, such as the rise of atheism in our day and age. And so I really feel strongly about this topic because of people close to me that I've seen go far away from the path of the Creator, far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it is an essential requirement for every believer to spread as much good as they possibly could. A person does not have to be a scholar in order to spread the message of Islam. Rather, anyone who is able to should convey at least one message, at least one good thing about the Creator, about the Qur'an, his speech, about the Prophet ﷺ, the other messengers. And the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to do that. عني, spread about me, spread the message, convey the message to other people, even if it was one ayah, even if it is one thing. And so I feel strongly in this regards. And again, I really emphasize the point that I am a nobody and that anyone who wants to spread good can spread good. Anyone who is sincere about spreading good will find an avenue and a platform and a way to spread good, even if it is with the simplest and least way of good manners. And that is the least that all of us could do as Muslims. And so, alhamdulillah, I've been studying Islam since a young age with my father and with other local and global shiuch. Uh, a lot of my studies have been self-studied uh, with my own curriculums, and I'm currently pursuing a master's in Islamic studies, alhamdulillah. And I plan to continue down that path uh, with a PhD and as much as I possibly can, inshallah ta'ala, if Allah permits me to study further. Now, in regards to uh, actual experience, I've been an imam and I've been a youth director, so I've dealt with a lot of the problems that youth are faced with around the world especially in Western societies. A lot of the issues that come up in regards to the struggles that they go through, the tribulations and the temptations and things like that. And so I guess this is a good way to transition back to you, inshallah ta'ala, in regards to our topic for today. Barakallahu feek, Shaykh. MashaAllah, at such a young age, the Shaykh has achieved lots of credentials to himself. Alhamdulillah, and I pray to Allah that all of our audience, the youngsters especially, they have a role to play and they get inspired but what, mashallah, the Shaykh has done and he'll be continuing to do, inshallah, we pray to Allah for that. Jazakallah khair. Shaykh, you gave us a good lead and that would be the topic for our series now in the discussion in this interview, that is trials and tribulations. 
Yes, dear viewers, the times at which we live in are the times of trials and tribulations. So, to start with, Sheikh, I would like to ask you, what is the definition of trials and tribulations? And what is the Arabic equivalent for it? And what does it mean for a Muslim and mankind as a whole? Barakalawfiq. So this topic of trials and tribulations, I firmly believe every single person can relate to it. Muslim or otherwise, old and young, everyone can relate to the topic of struggles, the topic of going through and striving through something difficult, facing a hardship and adversity in our lives. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us about the purpose of this life. And if we understand the purpose of this world, we will understand in the context of our struggles. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Every single person is coming to taste death. Every single person shall taste death. And some interpretations and some translations are actually a little different when they say everyone is currently tasting death. So that every second of our lives, every second that leaves, every time we breathe, every beating of our heart, part of our life is gone. And so every part of our life is gone has to remind us that we are going somewhere else. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, and this is verse 35 of Surah Al-Anbiya where he says, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ And we test you, we try you with what? With evil, with hardships, and with good as a fitna. وَإِلَيْنَا تُرْجَعُونَ And to us, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we shall all return. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this because the concept of struggling to many people has a negative connotation. And so they think that struggles, for example, is to be poor in poverty. And struggles is to go through a sickness. And struggles is only to go through these hardships that we face that are different and contrary to our desires. And so the real context of struggles and trials, a real fitna for us, is anything that we have in this world of good and bad. And so the example of that is someone who is very wealthy. And for some people, wealth corrupts them. Wealth corrupts them in a way that takes them away from the Creator, takes them away from their purpose in life, takes them away from the hereafter. And so we have these many different types of examples of good and bad, easy and hard. And for many people, the concept of struggling with something good is something they desire. Because they feel, oh, if I had a lot of wealth, then I would be a good person. And so some people, they will ask and ask and pray for a lot of wealth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his wisdom, he knows what kind of good we can handle as believers and what kind of difficulties we can handle as believers. And we have so many sins that have accumulated that we don't even think about anymore. We forget, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. We forget and we turn to Allah and ask him to forgive. And so we have sins that accumulate and we're purified through that. Another way that we are purified through these struggles is that oftentimes we become heedless of Allah in the times of ease, the times when we don't feel the difficulty. And we can all relate to that on one degree or another. So for a person who is not going through any hardships, they might feel like everything in life at that moment in their life is lined up. And so at that point in life, they feel like, I don't really need Allah. And this is where shaitan pulls people away from Allah. They feel that I have everything lined up. Everything is working out for me. Why should I turn to Allah? When they forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from their previous struggles. They forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from their previous hardships. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves people from their hardships and Allah gets them through them. And after they get through the hardship, what do they do? They usually go away from Allah. They turn away from Allah and they no longer ask Him for help. They no longer feel dependent upon Allah. Where when we talk about life and the purpose of life as the creation, we have to realize that it requires us to embody and exemplify servitude. And so submission to Allah. And part of that submission to Allah is knowing that as a creation, we are weak and always in need. And the second part of the servitude is knowing that no one can fulfill that need except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we don't have the servitude, then we will become prideful and arrogant and independent. We feel that we can take care of matters on our own. And this is when people pull away from Allah. And oftentimes, if Allah loves a person and this person has sincerity in their hearts, Allah will turn them back. And so they'll go through this struggle. They'll go through this purification process, this fitna, in order for Allah to bring them back to Him. Because when people go through hardships, they usually turn back to Allah. And this is not only believers, but also disbelievers as well. And I have a personal example about this. About five years ago, I worked with a pharmacist, and he was a non-Muslim. He was an atheist, actually. And so he was atheist, and he was actually of Indian origin. And um, he told me a lot about his background coming from India. 
and how when he went to the United States, he went there with this goal in mind, this objective in mind, to become rich and wealthy as a pharmacist in order to provide for his family back home. And so they gathered everything they could in his village. They gave him all of this money, and they said, go and take care of your studies, become a pharmacist, and we're depending on you. His entire family, and the family is not like a small family, it's a huge family, all the relatives as well. And so as he's studying and studying and studying, he said it became so difficult for him. And this man is a hardcore atheist, like a very strong proponent of atheism. And so he's studying for a few years, and it becomes very difficult for him. He said at times it became so difficult that he had to work minimum wage jobs to get a few dollars an hour in order just to eat. And he said at one point it became so difficult that he wanted to tell his family that he was going to give up. He wanted to go back home. But he said there is nothing to do back home. If he goes back home, then he's a big failure and a disgrace and a loss to his family because he had went forward with this intention of becoming rich. And now he couldn't do it. The struggle was too great. And so the struggle, he said, was so magnificent in his life. And the reason he brought up this story to me was because we discussed religion a lot. And he used to insult faith. He used to insult faith in the Creator. And I didn't talk to him about Islam as much as I talked to him about believing in the Creator, believing in a higher being, in a higher deity. And so when we talked about the Creator, I asked him, tell me the most difficult time in your life, the most severe time in your life, the biggest struggle that you ever went through. And so he said after this point, when he started contemplating going back home, his family told him, don't bother. If you come back home, we will shun you and banish you. And so he said at that point, he contemplated suicide. He actually wanted to commit suicide. He said it became so severe for him that after a while, he actually, in the midst of the night, he couldn't sleep because of all these thoughts and the contemplation of suicide. He said he actually stood there and said, oh God, please help me. If you exist, please help me. And he was helped. And he became a very rich, one of the richest pharmacists in our state of Michigan. And what happened to him next was very interesting. Jazakallah, Sheikh. And we will continue with the story, inshallah. Now we take a break and we resume after the break. Although Christianity doesn't have a single credible source to justify her claims of the crucifixion, she yet continues to propagate her myth. They do this by hiding many of their deceptions behind cleverly designed doctrines. Did you know that Christianity stands or falls at the cross? So how did they do this? Join me for the series called The Cross Question. Probe the past that proves Christianity in practice is fictitious in The Cross Questioned. Tomorrow at 11.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12.30 p.m. India on Peace TV. Thursdays provide. In Britain, we are facing one big problem, that are you Muslim or British? The space to talk. In India, back home, they ask, are you a Muslim first or Indian first? And we Muslims should know how to reply, how to turn the tables over. The place to knock. Why Trinity cannot be regarded in that sense, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The opportunity to ask. But even if we agree that what the Christians say, that he was crucified, so if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for three days, who controlled the world? That means even God died? The freedom to unmask. So there are various ways which we can prove the argument yeah, to be yeah. wrong. Let's meet Dr. Zakir every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. A die dynamic. I challenge any human being to point out a single fundamental of Islam. In youthful quest. Which is against humanity as a whole. Iconic, inspiring, encouraging. Don't judge Islam based on the following. Farik Nai. Judge Islam based on the authentic sources, sources that the Quran and, 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 and authentic Son of the world famous orator on Islam and compassion.
comparative religion, Dr. Zakir Naik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an opportunity to do a proper job and to earn a proper reward. A star above par in Teens Star, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We welcome you back for this interview that which we are having with Sheikh Suleiman Salim from USA. And Sheikh, before the break, was discussing with us the story of an atheist from India who happened to you know, make an earning for this world and he did not believe in the hereafter. Sheikh, can you please continue with the story? What happened next? Absolutely. It was something very interesting because I asked him about the biggest struggle of his life, the biggest difficulty in his life. And so he started telling me this story. He started narrating to me what happened to him. And this man, again, he's a very severe and very strong and hardcore atheist. He disbelieves in the creator. And so he's talking to me about his struggle, and he says at one point he contemplated suicide because his family didn't even want him back home. And he was a failure to his family if he had gone back home. So he stood there in the night, and he started asking. He started praying. And he's a man who doesn't pray. He doesn't believe in the creator. But at that point in his life, he felt that the need was so great, the struggle was so great. He felt deep down, subconsciously, that there was a creator. And this is the fitrah. This is the human disposition, the natural disposition of humans. We know there is a creator. But some of us choose to reject that with ignorance and with arrogance and with fake disguised intellect. And so this man said, I started praying to God for help. And I said, okay, what happened after that? And his nickname was Paul because his name was so long I couldn't pronounce it. We called him Paul. So I said, Paul, what happened after that? He says, after a while, I started praying and praying, and I realized that it had become easier for me. And he passed through his exams, and he passed through all that he needed to do in order to become a pharmacist. And he became one of the greatest pharmacists in our region, in the state of Michigan. And he's one of the highest paid pharmacists. And now he does more than just pharmacy. He's making compounds, and he's making other things for his corporation and business. And so he succeeded beyond what I could imagine. And he told me, he said that at that point in my life, I felt so low that I turned to the Creator. And so I asked him very directly and very frankly. I said, Paul, if you turned to the Creator at one point, you knew there was a Creator when you were struggling, and He helped you through your struggles. How can you reject Him now? How can you disbelieve in Him now? How can you believe that those struggles were not followed by ease because of the one that you prayed to? And he had no response. And usually this man was responding to everything. He was very argumentative. He became silent and he walked away. And he started thinking about what he had relayed to me. It wasn't something that I said or did. It was his own realization that when you go through a struggle, you know eventually that you need to turn to the Creator. And that is what we do as human beings. We turn to the Creator for help and He helps us. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, insan, When we test people with difficulties, they ask the Creator for help. And after He relieves them, they turn away from the Creator. And this is the worst thing that anyone could do. And so the turning away from the Creator, this heedlessness that we're talking about, it's at varying degrees and levels. So even for some Muslims, some believers in the Creator and other people that believe in the Creator, even them, when they believe in the Creator, when the relief is there and the difficulty is gone, they no longer focus as much on the relationship and the remembrance and their connection to the Creator. And so these struggles oftentimes bring us back to reality. They bring us back to worshiping Allah. And so when someone goes through a fitna, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing you back to him. Allah is reminding you that he loves you. And this is a blessing because the fitna is not necessarily a difficulty that's there to punish you. Oftentimes and most times it's there to bring you back because Allah loves you. Because the creator wants you to turn back to him in remembrance and in worship. And so these fitna that we see around us and that we experience in our lives, they're a form of us returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everyone before us and everyone after us will go through these fitan, will go through these hardships. And fitna itself can be defined in many different contexts. And yet, because we are discussing trials and tribulations, we are using the context of the fitna as something that is difficult, something that purifies us. So the hardships and the struggles and the trials and tribulations that we go through. Sheikh, mashallah, jazakallah khairan for sharing that story with us. But our viewers would like to know whether that person really accepted Islam or not. Honestly, I don't know. I would have to follow up with him. 
because I did see him about two years later, and I wanted to try to kickstart and jumpstart this conversation about faith again to see where he was. And he seemed like a different person. However, our short meeting was literally in passing, and so I did not get to follow up with him. However, I will find out, inshallah ta'ala, whether this man accepted Islam or not. And the reality is that people, whether they accept belief in God or not, they did realize at one point, they did realize at one point that they had to turn to the Creator and that their struggles were too great. And these struggles are not only our struggles, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, He tests the people who are closest to Him first. And so the example He gave us is that the Prophets are the most tested. The Prophets are the most tested with hardships. And then those after them in faith, those after them in righteousness, and after them, and after them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests people in this world and they go through these hardships of this life because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing them closer and closer to Him. And these people, as a result of that, they have a higher status in the sight of Allah and a higher rank in paradise in the hereafter. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us paradise. I mean, we pray to Allah wa ta'ala that atheist brother too accepts Islam Amen. and comes closer to his creator. Shaykh, mashallah, we learned about what the meaning of fitna is. And during the course of your talk, you made a mention that fitna should rather not be taken in a negative sense. It can have its own lessons to teach us. And it also re-emphasizes the lesson we learn from the Quranic verse, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْأُثْرِ يُسْرَى That verily, with every difficulty, there is ease. And Alhamdulillah, you did mention about that as well. Sheikh, we would want to know more about how this fitna can develop an individual, not just in this world, but as well as in the life to come. So fitna, again, it can be used for some people to bring them closer to Allah. If they are sincere and they turn towards the Creator during that moment, they can get closer to Allah. And others are actually choosing to turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the fitna of hardship, and especially the subject of hardship as a fitna, for some people, they have a negative connotation about it. They see it as a form of hardship, so that is all that they see. Because our base self, our carnal desires, we wish for peace and relief and relaxation and food and drink, the desires of this world. That is what we strive for. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to pull our nafs in a different direction, and that is the direction of self-discipline, to know how to control oneself and not to focus on the pleasures of this world, rather to strive to go through hardships. And an example of that is when we fast. So for some people, they look at fitna of hardship. For example, if they're going through something depressing in their lives or they're going through a sickness in their lives, they will take it as a form of difficulty and so they won't look at the bright side. They won't look at the good aspect of this fitna. But when you look at fasting, fasting requires struggling. It requires us to do something that we necessarily and naturally don't desire, which is to stay away and to abstain from food and drink and intimacy and anything that is ill of speech or action. And so when you look at Fasting, for many people fasting, they look at it as something difficult. Even though they know there's a reward and they look forward to the reward and they have faith in the reward. And yet while they are fasting and feeling that pain, some people they succumb to the pain and they can no longer handle that struggle. They can't handle that difficulty. And so they think only of their base desires. They don't look at the other side, which is the side of vast rewards in the sight of Allah. Allah rewards fasting as something magnificent. Another aspect of it is a form of forgiveness for our sins. Any difficulty you go through, even the Prophet ﷺ said, if a thorn is to prick you, if a thorn is to prick you, or sadness is to overcome you, that is a form of purification for you. So you look at the positive aspects of it. And so when you fast, you're also building your self-discipline. You're building your ability to appreciate all the things that you have. You also look at those people who are less fortunate. They don't have as much food. And so you are building this strong side of yourself because of this difficulty that you're going through. And again, when you look at the fitna of any hardship that a person experiences, you look at the aspect of how does this make me a better person? How does this bring me closer to the Creator? So when someone is going through hardship, remember that every second of that hardship is you getting closer to your Creator, is your sins being erased and removed, expiated for. And this is a blessing, because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want to forgive us, He wouldn't bring us closer to Him to do so. So Allah is forgiving our sins through the hardships of this life in order for us to have paradise in the next life. And so every struggle we go through is a way for us to raise our rank in paradise. Every hardship that we are patient with and pleased with as decree, as qadr, 
then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it to forgive our sins in this life and to raise our rank in the next life. MashaAllah. Jazakallahu khairan, Shaykh. Alhamdulillah, today we learned in this episode that the fitna not just has a negative connotation to it, but also has a positive side. And for the believers especially, we have patience in the decree of Allah and we will be rewarded for the difficulties that which we face. And we also believe that Allah does not burden a soul more than it can bear. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. So inshallah, we will continue on the same series of trials and tribulations in the next episode. Until then, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh